my name is Anthony Ball. I'm head of the Department of Bioengineering, and it's a really great pleasure to welcome you all on my behalf and on Holger's. He will say a little bit more in a minute um, to Holger's inaugural lecture. Um, Holger is a, a fantastic colleague, and those of you who know him well uh, will already know that, and I don't have to tell you that. Um, in fact, it was announced today that he's a recipient of the Rector's Award for um, Research Supervision. And I think that many of you in the room have benefited from his supervision, and perhaps maybe the reason for his award as well, that you nominated him. Um, so on his behalf, I thank you for that. But clearly, um, that's fantastic. <laughs> So we're in an unusually shaped lecture theatre, so those on this side should know that you're not alone. There are people over here as well, and if there's laughter from over there, it means you didn't get the joke, okay? <laughs> and vice versa. Um, I think Holger epitomises what it means to be a bioengineer, and you'll see that in a minute. So for some, bioengineering is engineering for the life sciences. For some, it's engineering for medicine. I think Holger reflects a very different aspect it's biomimetics or bio-inspired engineering. And we will see a lot of that today. Holger, um, his first degree was in biology, neurobiology, from Tübingen, and where he did his PhD at the Max Planck Institute. Um, he, uh, he did five years um, elsewhere in another institution, and more of that maybe later from Simon. Um, and then he was appointed here at Imperial College as a senior lecturer in 2005 and has flown through the ranks and has been a great contributor in many different ways. He's been a stalwart of the department. He served on many appointments panels. We know how hard work that is. Um, he served as Deputy Director of Postgraduate Studies and then Director of Postgraduate Studies and part of the management team. And um, he's had a few years off, but he's recently agreed to join the Departmental Management Committee again, and I'm pleased about that. Um, he's taken on a senior line management role for junior academic staff, and he's perfectly positioned to do so. He was promoted to reader in 2009 and to professor last year. Uh, and on a personal note, I'd like to thank Holger today for his support as our smallish department grows to be a largest department. And he's been a real uh, key part of that. He has a strategic perspective. He takes the bigger view. He has his own opinion on things for sure. Um, but he definitely uh, takes the bigger picture and the view for us all. And uh, I'd like to thank him for that. Holger, we are super excited to hear what you have to say and how you will manoeuvre your way around your inaugural lecture. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Anthony, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for coming. Of course, this is a very special lecture, and I've, I've been giving a couple of lectures in the past, but uh, this is uh, certainly, certainly something to remember. Well. I think I'll just kick in and um, actually I will uh, talk a little bit more about the neuroscience aspect of it and of course how it could potentially be applied, but uh, just to give you an idea where I'm coming from in a way, uh, I put up this slide here with a couple of photographs that Ola Tengstenberg, my, um, my uh, supervisor has put together a long time ago. And they actually illustrate one, one thing you find in nature. No matter what complex movements uh, are performed, you see some of uh, general sort of reflexes in place, like keeping the head level uh, to make sure that the visual processing is benefiting um, in all these different cases. No matter whether you look at birds or you look at a cheetah here chasing a hare, humans in all different sorts of sports activities or on a motorcycle, and you find something like that in a simple insect as well. Well, I was always interested in how the nervous system is actually organizing all this behavior and controlling reflexes. And I will, you will see a lot, hopefully not too much of that in, uh, during my lecture. But just um, to uh, give a little starting point, um, I, I put up this slide, and many of you don't know about that. Some definitely do, because they were not exactly um, innocent in my development as a, um, a sort of neuroscientist, but this is actually what I was interested in before I even started my university education in 1985. Uh, um, a, a guy called John Eccles, who happened to win the Nobel Prize at one uh, point, and I think Simon, uh, Simon Laughlin knows him personally, or no. no, you didn't. 
Anyway, he fascinated me in the context of discussing how everything works in terms of the nervous system. So I started reading a couple of books by him, and here with Karl Popper, a philosopher, and then here uh, just to learn a little bit about the, the human brain. Uh, these are unfortunately all the German titles, but I try to put a, oh no, the original titles are given as well. And then one of the latest books of um, Eccles was that one with a <coughs> philosopher, sorry, a psychologist, Robinson or so, uh, Robinson, yes, where you found at page number 70 this statement. Mm. Well, in theological terms, each mind-soul is a divine creation assigned to the development fetus at some point between conception and birth. That didn't do it for me. That's when I stopped reading the books by Eccles and uh, decided really I want to do some neuroscience uh, all together. Well, it wasn't even insects I started working on originally. This is actually the first intracellular recording of a nerve cell where I stayed the neuron as well. And it was not in an insect, but it was actually in a pyramidal cell in a preparation that was very fancy in the early 80s, um, where people tried to figure out how um, the nervous system stores information. And actually, this was a fantastic experience, even though nonetheless, after that um, experience working with rats, it become, became even more clear on that. For me, it's just insects. Well, too complicated. So I, I then thought, okay, maybe it's this one here I should concentrate on. You will see one of our little flies here now taking off and doing something like this. I guess you haven't seen that before. Uh, well, some of you def definitely have. But it's quite amazing what they can do in terms of uh, flight maneuvers. Now, that is actually a problem uh, interesting enough to spend a lot of time on. And I'm going to talk about that um, in my uh, presentation a little bit in, more, in, in uh, a little bit more detail. But let me just stay, uh, take a step back to start with and just give you an idea of, of how I think um, or oh, what's really important to keep in mind if you look into the function of the nervous system. Now, say we have an, an animal or a biological system, as I put it here. Now, it's situated in its environment. And actually, to, to, to make sure that the behavior it produces is somehow related to the conditions it's, it's working on or working within, um, it is actually sampling information. Information means, like, what's happening out there in terms of um, is there anything to, to listen to that's interesting or to see that's interesting? And then um, the information is actually uh, propagated in the nervous system. It will be processed by some sensor or sensory systems. And then we have several of sensory systems. So we have the auditory system, the visual system, a couple of others. We combine all the information and integrate it. And then in the end, we transform whatever the sensors tell us into a, si a signal that's actually used to control movements. It's true for us, it's true for flies, it's true for basically everything that, that is uh, done uh, um, there in the world and produces behavior. Now, all these different steps here, if you want to understand how it's working all together, um, deserve some attention. And actually, you should look at all the different levels and try to understand what the underlying design is uh, in the end. Now, flies. Why, is, why are flies particularly interesting, except for the fact that they're very easy to breed? A uh, very practical consideration, of course. But um, let's have a look at these two. This is actually uh, a blowfly species, and then here it's a completely different species. That's a, a modern jet uh, fighter. But they have something in common. And some of you probably know already what the answer is to the question what it is they have in common. Well, they are aerodynamically unstable. Sounds a little bit strange, but actually makes perfect sense if you think about it. So you're not, they are not passively stabilized. They can basically change their orientation or whatever in space very, very quickly. Now, if you have this sort of uh, situation with this instability, and you combine that with what's called a feedback, so sensory information that's acquired by all the sensors the, the insects have, and you put that together into a, a control system, what you get is exceptional uh, maneuverability. And that's actually 
quite amazing. If you look at the, the data, taking into account the scale of the different uh, systems here, the, the, the fly and the jet fighter, this one here is way superior. And we would really like to know how that's done. Well, uh, one lead into this is actually um, uh, to look at the differences now from, from the similarities. Well, a jet fighter is using just a few sensors like pitot tubes or inertial measurement units to acquire what sort of state it is in and then uses supercomputers to work out what sort of control signals or control uh, commands need to be sent to the uh, control surfaces like uh, aileron or, or the rudders to maintain stability. Well, in um, flies, it is actually a little bit different. So there are many sensors, so we've got eyes and some sensilla which can measure pressure on the, on the cuticle, on the, on the skin basically of the animal, or mechanoreceptors which can also measure pressure or, or strain. And all this information um, uh, that's obtained all over the body is then used to create some feedback. Now in, in a little bit more of a, well, typical a diagram that uh, control engineers would, would use, but a very simple, uh, simplified one in this case, uh, it looks like this then. Few sensors in the jet fighter run their signals into a supercomputer, then we have the controls here. In control terms here, sensor, supercomputing, control surfaces, and then this uh, control loop makes sure that the, the system stays stable. Now, let's have a look at the fly. Well, in this case, we have the eyes, say, as sensors, in that um, case, and we have two uh, actions that need to be controlled. I mentioned this, the gaze already uh, before, and then the flight motor. And uh, if we look in, into a similar sort of uh, presentation of the, the situation, then what is actually clear is there's something missing. So we don't have the supercomputing bit in the flies. That is very interesting. They have to solve it somehow, and I'll try to so uh, show you later how they do it in terms of um, how visual information is used. Well, so here, virtually no computation and a huge number of local sensors. Now, what other sensory systems uh, do we have that could um, provide the animal with information of how it's moving around? Well, we have, I mentioned already, some mechanosensory systems. Um, I'll get back to that in a little bit more detail later on. Proprioceptive systems which tell some, uh, the animal something about joint angles or some internal states the, the animal is in. And then we have the visual system, of course, and we will stay with that and I will concentrate on that in the next couple of fly, uh, uh, slides. So, vision plays a major role. How does vision help in that case? Now, it's maybe important to know that there is a relationship between we are, actually, we are moving in space and what sort of visual input we get. So, there is... Um, um, uh, this relationship that was formerly uh, called as, or w was called an optic flow field that always arises when, when we or our eyes move relative to the, to the surrounding. I'll give you a little example uh, for that in the next video, which actually I think I got many years ago from Graham, uh, who himself, got, Graham Taylor from Oxford, who himself got it from the BBC, and it shows actually um, Ah. So it shows a goshawk uh, that's actually flying through the woods and there's a camera mounted on the back. And now as the goshawk is moving with the camera, the camera is taking uh, sequences of, of images and actually because the shutter speed is so too long and uh, uh, it can't take too many, um, uh, too many individual shots, there's always some sort of motion streak. This is slow motion now. You can actually see that the bird is rotating in one direction, rotating in the other direction. And then what the result is, is a, a heavily blurred sequence of images. We can take out one, one snapshot here, um, for instance in the situation when the, the bird is rolling in one direction, and then you can see that the whole world is shifting around a particular axis, this roll rotation axis of the animal. If it's in a different phase, it's translating forward, then the flow feed looks pretty different. Now, th there is sufficient information in these optic flow fields, which are really described by little vectors, each of which gives the direction of motion um, of the image relative to the camera in this case. Um, there is enough information to retrieve what uh, the animal is doing in terms of the translation and the rotation um, 
uh, during its flight in this case. But how is actually motion, the direction of motion or image shifts, how is this analyzed? Well, that gets us, I jump on that one, gets us uh, to this question that was in fact addressed in the very institute where I did my PhD and diploma um, uh, work like 60 years ago. And it was done by um, two people uh, who happened to be a biologist here and a physicist, um, Bernhard Hassenstein and uh, Werner Reichert. Well, they were really intrigued about the fact that animals, if you present them motion in one direction, they would normally follow that motion and try to minimize actually the displacement of the world on their retina. And they wanted to know what is the, the, the structure, what is the, the way in which the nervous system computes this direction of motion and did a couple of fantastic experiments. I love that. Um, oh, Simon does as well. Uh, <laughs> so, they did really high-tech experiments on, uh, to discover what's called an elementary movement detector. Um, an elementary movement detector can distinguish between motion in one and the other direction. And this is all based on the behavior I just mentioned before. This is a beetle in this case. It's actually turning to the right when a pattern around the beetle is rotated to the right as well. And then what you just, uh, they just did is they provided the beetle with what's called a Y-maze or Spangenglobus in German. And this Spangenglobus had, uh, has different dissection, uh, um, decision points where the beetle can either move the globe to the left or to the right. And then you can sit there and actually just note how often it's moving to the left or to the right depending upon the visual patterns you present to that animal. So you can learn something by performing an input-output analysis about what's internally happening in the nervous system. And what they came up with is the uh, so-called elementary movement detector. And I'm going to explain to you how that works. So remember, what we want to understand is how can the nervous system dis distinguish between movement in one direction or the opposite direction. Now, these movement detectors, they need to have two input elements. You can't work out motion with, with only one. And then what happens is, if you have, say, a little light block here, so light intensity goes up in the center, and it's actually caught by one input element here, then the signal that's generated is just delayed. It stays there at that epsilon for some time. Now, in the meantime, the, the intensity is hitting the second input. And there, the signal is immediately translated, or well, transmitted to a stage here, which is a um, combination from both signals at um, a function or by a function that's equivalent to a multiplication. Now, it's very clear that um, if this epsilon holds back the signal for as long as it takes the distribution to reach the second input, then you will have a coincidence of both signals at the multiplication stage. And then you get an output. If, however, you move from the other side, so you come from right to left, uh, the signal is immediately uh, propagated down here to the multiplication and reaches only way later um, the second input and is even delayed, then you separate in, in uh, time these two inputs and the output will be almost zero. Now, if you two, uh, take two of those in mirror symmetrical configuration, what you can um, build is a bidirectional motion detector, which, if you move something from left to right, is giving you a positive output by just adding up the output of these uh, uh, two and a half detectors. And if you move something from right to left, then you get a negative output. This includes basically all the necessary conditions to distinguish between motion in one or the other direction. And we need this mechanism to be able to analyze optic flow fields. Right, so um, there were other places where people have came up with similar ideas. In Cambridge, for instance, uh, uh, um, um, Barlow and Levick came up with a model that is basically very similar functionally. But all these models have in common that you can use it to analyze the movement or visual motion altogether. Well, and we know from lots of research in tubing and other places that the motion um, uh, that a fly sees when it's moving around would be analyzed along these uh, omotidial rows within the hexagonal eye lattice. 
so along the vertical row and then oblique rows. And we've got three axes in this case because it's a hexagonal uh, 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 lattice. Now, what we do in, in, in my lab is actually we, we perform a lot of different uh, uh, well experiments, either doing um, behavioral studies, neuroanatomy or um, anatomical or uh, anatomical studies, neurophysiology and pharmacology, and then some modeling, of course, and ultimately we want to test whether the ideas we get from our studies can actually be used in a practical way, so to speak. I'll get back to that later. Well, let's maybe, before I uh, um, continue here, uh, think about a, a very uh, common misconception about fly or insect vision. Uh, they have a lot of facets, but they actually they don't see multiple uh, images. What they roughly see, and I have to thank Lorena Deuker, who is in the audience and uh, helped me out once, when I had to give a public lecture in Bonn with this, just uh, um, uh, uh, put together a filter that would actually give us the, the uh, hexagonal, or what the fly basically would see. Um, right, okay, but now back to uh, optic flow and self motion. Now, I have to uh, talk about briefly about a problem that visual systems altogether um, phase when they want to use optic flow to decide how they are moving in space. Now what I show you here is a, uh, is a vector field um, of, um, or an optic flow field that is generated when the fly is just moving upward. Then the whole world would shift in the opposite direction. That's all indicated by these local errors. And the, the space that's plotted here is basically the entire uh, uh, spherical visual space. Flies can see almost everything except for a tiny little fraction behind them where their body is obstructing the view. So this is, in principle, all available, the whole optic flow field to the flies and could be analyzed. Now, this is, a, uh, this is another um, optic flow field that would be generate, uh, uh, generated when the fly is rolling around the long and longitudinal axis. You saw uh, a part of that with the Goshawk optic flow I, I uh, showed earlier. Now, if we assume that we have elementary movement detectors of the type I explained to you a little bit earlier, and we have one that's watching out here at, at, at 90 degree in the lateral visual field, it would be exciting, actually, in both cases, when the fly is performing a, a lift movement, but also when the fly is rolling. So if we just know the output of this one detector, it wouldn't tell us what actually happened in terms of the more movement. How can we resolve that? Well, obviously, at the global level, they look very different, these fields. And what you can Im imagine is that um, what the nervous system does is it is creating something like a matched filter, so to speak. If this is a pattern, that's called um, one part of these optic flow patterns, um, and this pattern needs to be detected, then out of the set I, I showed you here of elementary movement detectors, which are available um, to analyze motion in different directions, you only select those where the local preferred directions, so these little errors and their orientation, match the individual orientation of retinal image shifts in the input. And then you integrate or combine all the, the inputs, and then the output uh, 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 can then be used or well in, in, um, uh, by such a hypo uh, hypothetical filter neuron uh, to indicate whether or not there is some role movement going on. And then, of course, for different rotations, you can, different, can have different filters, and they give uh, you signals that can be immediately lose, used, more or less, for control. Now, how do you find out about that? Um, well, we know that, that already from previous uh, research, uh, it was known that there are neurons which have these properties of responding to visual motion, and you can re record from them and analyze their responses in great detail. I show you a little video on that, uh, that was taken here in, um, uh, yeah, actually, it was done here by Kit Longden, a former uh, postdoc, and Navita Yas, a former um, PhD student. Now, what you see in the center here is a fly. And then we have recording electrodes that allows us to measure the electrical signals within the visual system of the fly. Now, I'll start this here. And as you can see, while, the, while this dot is moving, there is a very characteristic pattern of responses that depends on the direction, the, the instantaneous direction of motion of the dot. So 
obviously this neuron is um, uh, responding to directional motion in a, in a very specific way. Now you can do that experiment at many different positions in the visual field and then reconstruct for each of those positions what is the direction in which the dot has to move so that the neuron responds maximally. And then you use all that data, you can analyze that across different cycles, you use all the data, and then you can um, present the data in a very similar way as I presented the optic flow fields before. But this time, it's actually the sensitivity or a so-called matched filter for particular optic flow, flow fields that was set up in the, in the nervous system of the fly. This one here by um, a cell um, uh, uh, that's called vertical system cell number six, for instance, uh, produces or has a, a, a receptive field that is actually pretty much matched to a roll rotation. And then we've got other fields. This one here would be matched uh, to a rotation that's in between roll and pitch. So there's a whole set of these neurons which indicate to the animal, am I pitching, rolling, or doing um, uh, any other rotation in space? Well, you can, with this information alone already, you can, or if you, if you, um, if your name is uh, Sean Humpert, uh, you can actually put it all into a nice uh, control engineering framework. This was actually done, uh, done by uh, Sean. Um, and then use basically the, uh, the, the results or the, re the, the, the results we got from biology, put it as filters into the control loop, and then actually make sure you use those to control what an aerial robot is doing. And um, that looks that's actually, there must be a later, uh, newer version around uh, by now. This is, a, this is a drone or a quadcopter that is flying around in the lab and it, it, it casts the visual world onto a CCD chip, analyzes the optic flow, runs it through these matched filters which we derive from biology and is then controlling the yaw angle, its orientation basically, and the distance to the wall and the forward speed. And that, oh. nasty sound, but it does the job. Just based on that very simple principle, without any supercomputing, it can actually maintain a, a, a distance from the wall that's required and assume a certain forward speed. So distance to the ground was controlled by uh, normal engineering sensors. Well, so, um, what uh, comes next? This one here, uh, I showed you, uh, demonstrates all this little video, it demonstrates really clearly that you can take the principles, you can put it on a technical platform, and it works. And this one is actually, that was really amazing uh, when I first saw that many years ago, I think more than 10 years ago, uh, uh, it, it was quite um, uh, fascinating. But this quadcopter is not exactly as maneuverable as a fly, is it? I mean, that was a little bit like, mm, Okay, but it did the job, but it didn't do, the, do it particularly well. And I think one of the major differences is that uh, flies, uh, they do a couple things different from engineering. Um, one is, for instance, they, they combine way more sensory information, I mentioned earlier, from uh, way more sensor systems than um, you would do in engineering. Well, to, to study, how the information is really integrated from different sensor systems, you can actually do a little bit of a shortcut rather than actually going through the pain and trying to analyze everything in free flight in, in animals and do recordings in free flight, which is at the moment very difficult and only in very few si systems you can do it. You can actually study a different behavior that is sort of linked to uh, flight and what the body is doing quite intimately. Now imagine if, if, if a fly or any other insect is actually blown off course, then what it normally does is it compensates with its head for the change of orientation of the body. So there must be a link, a very tight link, between what the, the head is doing and what the body is doing. So gaze stabilization should tell you something about what the animal is also capable of doing in, in terms of flight control. So there are a couple of reasons I put out here uh, which are uh, motivate uh, the flies actually to perform, or any animal anyway, I showed you that in the first slide, 
to, to stabilize the gaze. So A, it reduces this sort of motion blur to get a crisper um, uh, signal or uh, visual input. That's very important. Um, it makes it way easier if you uh, take sensory information always uh, with reference, so to speak, to gravity. Because whatever you do in terms of motor control has to relate to gravity, because that's what you have to overcome and, and make sure you, you stabilize against um, as well. Well, and then, of course, um, another point in terms of so how important it is to, to process visual inputs uh, properly um, is very clear. Uh, so our nervous system has a couple of problems with vision uh, anyway, and one of which is um, our retina is two-dimensional and the world is three-dimensional. Well, if we have a two-dimensional representation of three dimensions, that's always a little bit problematic. But if you can make assumptions about how everything is oriented, and you know, make a couple of assumptions about distances to objects and so forth, the problem becomes uh, mitigated. And you can actually way better analyze the visual scene in front of you. Actually, if you don't believe me, then you can try to read programs or whatever is on your computer screen uh, upside down. You will be able to do it, but it will take considerably more time rather than the situation when it's upside up. So that's um, another good reason. Um, right. Now, the behavior I will just, um, uh, we, we are looking at, and actually we are not the first. I have to say that very clearly. Roland Hengstenberg, who did a lot of work on, uh, on, behavior, on, on gaze stabilization in flies, uh, did some um, uh, some very similar work, but we make one important difference, and that is we try to put this all in a control engineering framework rather than always um, having different modalities uh, studied in a way that suits best the individual modality. If you don't have a, a unifying framework for the analysis, then it's very difficult to understand what's happening in the system altogether. Well, the experiments look like this. You can uh, use a high-speed video camera, and then you can see or direct it on the head of the fly. Here's the thorax. You can see the wings beating here. And you oscillate the thorax left to right. Um, that's uh, actually it's slow motion, so it would be at one hertz. And what you can see here is that the fly is actually trying to keep the, the gaze level. And, um, um, that's a standard procedure, and uh, you can do that at different frequencies and then learn about uh, how the, the system is uh, operating. The good thing about this sort of behavior is from the cells I was talking about earlier, the VS cells or lobular plate cells altogether, there's only one relay station to what's called the motor neuron, and the motor neuron is connecting to the muscles. That means we have only two synapses between our connections from the sensor, these matched filters, to the actual uh, um, neck motor system, uh, the muscles in it. And then, of course, the a logical um, uh, thing to do is um, look what happens actually at this level. What properties have these motor neurons if we compare to the properties we measured at the next level up here? And I'll show you some of the results uh, uh, Stephen Houston got a couple of years ago when, when we were still in, in Cambridge, and uh, he did actually an analysis of many of those motor neurons and measured all the local preferred directions. I showed you um, uh, how that was done. I showed you that a little bit earlier already. Um, and then you can compare actually what the motor neurons would respond to best in terms of self-rotations of the animal and compare that with those preferred rotations at the level of the matched filters. And actually, if you just, you don't have to understand every individual uh, vector here, but it's very clear that these patterns look very similar, right? So that means there is hardly a transformation going on from the sensory level to the motor level. Again, supporting the idea that there's no heavy computation going on between the sensor and the motors or motor system. The only difference is that um, the, uh, most of the um, uh, neck motor neurons have uh, um, preferences to motion really almost across the entire uh, uh, spherical visual field. 
And there is a theoretical argument that can be easily made that this is the only way or the best way, in fact, to distinguish between translation and rotation altogether. And these neurons, they want to know something about rotation because that's what the head is doing, rotating. And they need to counter a rotate for anything that the body is doing. Well, I don't go through these um, uh, nicely. I love this uh, otherwise, but I'm, I'm in the interest of time. I skip this now um, and give you just the qualitative uh, result where we just um, compare the po population of individual rotation axes uh, which you measure either at the level of the sensors in the visual system or at the level of the motor neurons which are then driving uh, the uh, uh, gaze stabilization behavior. And it's the red ones for the motor system, the blue ones here for the, uh, for the uh, uh, sensory, for the visual system, and they highly overlap. Again, supporting that there's hardly any computation going on. Right, but this is still vision. And we know, and this is actually some work uh, that was, summarized, was, was reviewed by, by Roland Hengstenberg a couple of years ago, um, that it's not only the visual system, but also it is some other systems which are working at way faster start time scales. Okay, what's shown here is on the y-axis the behavior, the gaze stabilization behavior, how well they are doing. So the higher the values on this axis here, like this one here, the better the system is operating. And then it is plotted against the velocity, in this case, the velocity at which the uh, animal is rotated around its, its axis. So it's very clear that this, uh, the mechanosensory system that has been probed here is showing a maximum response at around 1,000 degrees per second. Well, and then the uh, visual system that is coping with optic flow, if you have a pattern of movement um, uh, that is, is mimicking an optic flow field, and you present that to, to the animal, then you can actually see that the best response is only at around 100 degrees per second. So an order of magnitude uh, is slower. So both sensor systems complement each other somehow in terms of their response properties or, or response dynamics. Well, I should actually introduce that system to you, um, which um, uh, pr produce these results here. Now it's called a Halter system. All flying insects, well, the original flying insects, they had four, uh, two, they had four wings and two wing pairs. So two front wings and uh, two hind wings. Now in these so-called dipteran flies means they wear only two wings. The um, pair of hind wings has been transformed in a very efficient gyroscopic sense organ, which can actually provide high speed data on how the animal is moving around or being moved around. And that is actually very, very uh, useful for flies, which can in many situations not predict what's going to hit them if they fly into turbulent air or are caught by a gust of wind. So they need to have a very fast response in combination with something that can, get, uh, co um, can actually cope with the slow drifts, which the animal might al also um, experience when there's just a breeze of wind. And of course, people who are working on sensors, well, if you have a gyroscopic sensor or something like an inertial measurement unit, drift is a little bit of a problem. So combining these two different systems, like a very fast system and a comparatively slow system here, that's the way uh, the animals are doing it. And probably, well, um, if you use that in principle, you can actually uh, make some gains in, in terms of the performance of micro air vehicles as well. But I'm not going into all these different traces here because that's, um, uh, well, for the electrophysiologists, it's very interesting, but maybe not in the, in the bigger picture and from the engineering point of view. But what's very important here is that it's never, well, almost never just vision. But it is always a combination from, say, this Haltier system I mentioned before, uh, which is stimulated here, that's the waveform, and a visual input that results in massive activity. If you show only one or the other, you don't get any spikes. So you have a combination of visual and mechanosensory input that is actually dri driving, in this case, uh, neck motor neurons. Well, there is another system um, I didn't mention so far. It's another visual system that helps the animal to work out how it's changing its orientation in space. 
and that is called the Ocella system. It's three little lens eyes. Actually, I should have shown that in the, in the previous slide. Here on top of the, um, of the head, they just measure light levels at different uh, positions in space. And then they can, between, uh, they can actually compare between the light levels from these different positions and work out whether the fly is, say, rolling or pitching. They are very fast. It's a visual system, which means it's comparatively slow, but, from, uh, but given that the, it is a visual system, they are extremely fast. And what they do, and that's what um, uh, Matthew Parsons, in a project together with Simon in, uh, in uh, Cambridge, worked out, is basically the Ocella system, which is basically just sensing a rotation axis or is uh, giving information about a rotation between roll and pitch in one and uh, uh, in this uh, bunch of axes and here, and maybe covers one other axis, that's the roll axis, but that's all. It's a very crude system, doesn't give you detailed information about the, how the fly is rotating. While if you look at what the, what the motion vision pathway can do, so that the, the, uh, if you use, uh, if they analyze optic flow, they represent way more axes in the horizontal plane. Now why using a system that's so crude in combination with a system that's very good? Well, in terms of giving you more detailed information or covers more rotations. Well, the answer probably is this one here gives you a very detailed view of what's going on in terms of the rotation, but that one is faster. So you use the information from the fast but crude system projected into the axis here, which gives you a detailed image, and then you speed up all the responses in the motion-related um, uh, uh, responses or motion-induced in responses. So that's basically um, uh, one strategy to make sure that you have fast control, feedback control system, uh, signals available. Um, if you didn't, that might lead in um, or result in some instabilities. Right, here is, so to speak, um, um, again, in one of those compound slides, but this is really interesting for a particular aspect of it. Well, it shows, um, again, the, the apparatus here is the fly. There is our artificial world. It's dark in the, uh, below and it's bright above. Very simple. These are some of the example traces, how the animals are stimulated. Well, actually, this is the response. This would be the stimulus. And then you can ask the question, very similar to what I showed in, in terms of the velocities of the stimulus, um, you can actually ask, if you go over a, quite a range of frequencies as to, as to whether, um, um, in terms of rotating the animal, um, what are the responses here? So how well is the system responding to it? And, uh, and how quickly, as in how much is the response delayed with respect to the input? These so-called boulder plots show you that information. You can do that for different uh, uh, situations. In one case, where the hull tears and the visual system are in, intact, and you can do it also after you clip off the fast system and, and disable it. And then you will see that it's responding not very well anymore in the fast dynamic range. Well, performing what's, what's, what's uh, referred to as a linear systems analysis for the engineers, you can actually come up with a way in which the action of the Halter system here, symbolized by, by the symbol F, uh, double F, and the action of the, uh, uh, the visual system um, here is symbolized by F, FB, feed, the stand, stands for feedback, you can actually work out how these two systems act together to help the performance of the animal. Now this uh, box here is just giving you um, um, a symbol that uh, summarizes what the neck motor system itself is doing. I'll get back to that a little bit later. How does this work? So if we rotate the thorax of the animal, TR, Right? and we go to very high speeds, then the first system to pick up on that disturbance or external stimulus is the Halter system because it's faster and it's really well responding to far, high frequency oscillation. That information is immediately driving um, the compensa compensatory head movement. Now, because it's already uh, um, inducing compensatory, uh, compensatory head movements, the head is rotated and reduces the actual input velocity uh, profile, 
right? And then whatever is left there is actually picked up by the visual system and in the feedback loop it is taken care for in, uh, of the lower input velocities. That, if you think about that, is a very clever design. And it is not just adding up signals here. Because of the different response delays, this is a perfect setup by the Haltier system for the uh, feedback loop that's provided uh, by the, the visual system. And that um, can be illustrated. In fact, here's the same structure again. If you look now not at the, 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 the response um, over the frequency of the stimulus, but you can actually look at what the velocity distribution really is the fly eyes get to see. Now here is the distribution, sorry, here. This is the speed of, uh, of whatever is moving on the retina. And then here is just the frequency of occurrence. So it's a density function, in, uh, if you want, in engineering terms. Now this is actually the stimulus itself. It's as if the, 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 the stabilization system wouldn't do anything. Right? And just you rotate the thorax, no stabilization takes place. And that's the distribution of velocities. Now, if the hull tears are on, plus uh, the, uh, uh, the visual system, then the whole distribution is shifted towards lower velocities. That's the point of the system. And ideal, it would be if you really want, uh, you would be here where there is no remaining slip speed left, but it's not that good, the system. Now, for very high oscillation, frequencies, and that's actually what this uh, plot shows, what happens if you take the hull tears off is actually you make things worse. So the velocities go to higher values because the feedback si signals are arriving at the motor system way too late. That's exactly what you don't want. But as I said, combining these two feed-forward signals and feedback signals that is really the efficient way they do it and actually can uh, do a very decent job in controlling their gaze uh, at very high uh, simulation uh, velocities or frequencies. Transformation as in heavy computing. I made the point a couple of times during the talk already. It's just this clever integration of local visual motion signals that provides uh, the possibility of um, uh, driving the motor system already, symbolized by this, this overlap of the rotation axis. And this sort of coordinate system that's set up here um, is actually then receiving information from, say, the hull tears as well and other sensors to actually calibrate or um, uh, fit in or fill in uh, the, the different velocity uh, ranges at which this, the system can be stimulated. Major point really here, hardly any computation, selective integration of local information, and then you can drive the motor system. But, ah, well, motor activity, next step then. Well, I mentioned earlier in this very nice scheme of a controller that can uh, do an efficient head roll that we don't know that much about this box here. Well, we thought, actually, we means Daniel Schwinn a long time ago, five years or so, I think, and Martina Wicklein, who's also here, uh, together with uh, some students over the time um, in a project that's now taken over by Peter Swart uh, and uh, some, um, some students in the lab, uh, looked into the organization, really, of the motor system. Because wouldn't it be nice if we could have independent information about that's done actually in collaboration with the Natural History Museum next door. Now what you can see is here the head, and actually you have to look at the, the ama amazing spatial resolution. You can see some of the structures on here, here you can see the facets in the, in the eye. This is the, sen the, the, the nervous system, the visual system here. You can see some of the details. We are talking here about two to three um, um, microns resolution. And then, of course, what we're interested in is this area here where the muscles of the neck motor system attach to the cuticular st structures. Here again, you zoom through the head. Explode it if you want. And then we will zoom in into this area again. Now you can actually see some of the muscles which Peter and uh, Amna, a student in the lab, have been uh, 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 segregating, working out. And now are working on the properties of these muscles. I'll get there in a second. 
we can blend this in. Right, so we have got just, just the muscles here. We know where the attachment points are. And um, then you can do actually something that is done in the department in, 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 uh, in uh, different projects. You can apply a method that's called a finite element model, modeling. Basically, what you do is you can use the anatomical data we got, turn it into a mesh model, and each of those connections in the mesh model you can specify and, and, and give it uh, some mechanical properties, and then make predictions based on our anatomical data of what happens if individual muscles are actually contracting and exerting forces. And that is actually sh uh, shown in uh, the next slide, I hope. Right. Yeah, so inducing some forces here in a combination of muscles would pull actually the head in a way that um, the, the fly would probably do quite often during bank turn maneuvers or some maneuvers which are called Dutch roll, which is a combination of yaw and uh, uh, roll movements. So, of course, this is an, um, a first approach where you use all that, the three-dimensional data. You do then some modeling, and what you want to do ultimately is you want to validate what you got out of the predictions here by, uh, say, electrical stimulation of individual muscles, muscles to see whether that is uh, giving you uh, similar results. Well, that is not only um, blowflies which do this behavior. Um, it's shown on this one here. I show you now a different species, it's a hoverfly. And these are really interesting. So in the low dynamic range, as you could see, low movements, it's hardly compensating at all. But this is a stimulus that increases in frequency up to 20 hertz, I think. Is it 20 or 15? I think it's 20. And you can really see, the faster it goes, the better the stabilization. It's unbelievable. So, to trying to understand what the general principles are here, we do actually compare between different species. Anyway, I have to, um, I just realized that I should come to an end soon. Sorry. Now here's something, look at that. Well, this fly was not impressed with our stimulation uh, uh, <laughs> regime and actually tried to uh, probably escape or whatever, but it shows you what this motor system can actually do. This is a 270 degree rotation of the, of the next motor system around the roll axis. Unbelievable. Right, okay, now I have to be a little bit, apologies, uh, quicker here now, um, but there is actually one thing that you can actually top this, uh, this with, and, and sorry to, to present it like that, I shouldn't really do that, but wouldn't it be great if we had information about how the system is operating while the fly is still alive, and we can see what the motor, is, so the motor systems are doing while the fly is flying or moving its head. And that's actually a project we started again. Daniel Schwinn was the instigator of that a, a long time ago. Um, and it's a project that we uh, did with um, Graham Taylor in Oxford and Simon Walker, where we did an anatomical analysis, but in this case, in four dimensions. So what you can do is you can take a fly, put it in a particle accelerator, and then while the fly is in tethered flight mode, you can shoot your sequences of X-ray uh, images, do micro, um, uh, computer tomography with it, and then reconstruct uh, the movements. Now here you can actually see the hull hairs moving up and down in a second. So we see the thorax here altogether, Here's the wing hinge, one of the most complicated hinges in the animal uh, kingdom. And there's the halter going up and down in antiphase to the wing. This is really a fantastic source of information for how the flight motor works and actually how something that's working basically as a mechanical resonator, just moving up and down the wings, can be controlled. Why? To introduce some differential torque, or well, uh, lift, um, they have to control the wing bead parameters. So you can actually increase the wing beat on one side, not on the other. You can change the angle within which the wing is beating. And then you can also change, obviously, the angle of attack of the individual uh, uh, wing. This is the breathing system here. You could saw that's providing the, the flight motor with oxygen. 
These are some of the muscles again, the heart is here. Well, now by changing the, 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 the parameters of one wing, you can maneuver then. And for the changes, we're responsible for the changes uh, at either side are so-called steering muscles, which you can see here. This one here is buckling around, really interesting um, uh, operation here. Um, and they have the uh, impact on what the fly motor is really doing and how the maneuverability can, can in the end be uh, um, uh, created by this uh, fairly complex system. Okay, now I have arrived here by uh, the summary mm, and I hope you will remember a few points um, when you go home. Even if you didn't, you may have missed some, some of the details out there. Um, well, flies are extremely maneuverable, and they have very different ways of realizing that maneuverability, as you, I hope I could convince you of. They do one thing that's really amazing by combining information from different sensor systems to, um, to obtain this sort of maneuverability, and we can see that reflected in the way they can actually compensate for body movements in terms of um, head rotations. Well, um, it is all not supercomputing, but what it is, is using local ambiguous information, and that's true for any sensor system in biology, using this local ambiguous information, put it together, combine it or integrate it in a way that makes sense and gives you an output of that integration that can be used immediately for motor control. And that is the big advantage of these uh, uh, biological systems. They are way more than that, but uh, that's um, one of the major ones here. And they do that in a very efficient way in terms of energy expenditure. Uh, uh, Simon, you would know the wattage that, uh, that they use, the brains. And, and it is really tiny, uh, a brain with a, a comparatively small number of uh, nerve cells compared to our own brain. Now, um, uh, what I really want to emphasize here still is, if you want to get to a higher level of understanding in the system, really you have to run a combined or interdisciplinary research where you can actually look at all the different levels um, at which the system is operating. Now, I think, um, because I'm definitely through, and I thank you very much for your patience. I will have to jump, oh no, I show you the video, but not the next slide. It's just so fantastic. This is a hoverfly, maneuvering laterally like a helicopter, keeping the head completely stable, and then doing everything with the thorax and, and rotating of the thorax. The fly knows exactly what it's doing, and there is actually evidence, experimental evidence, that shows flies can predict what they are going to see when they do A, B, or C. They know exactly what's going to happen. And it was shown in the brain of the flies and in behavior at the same time. And that ability is a necessary condition to do or solve any cognitive task. That's actually where the whole thing closes a little bit. And um, uh, where I can just say, in the end, by staying with insects, I have lost nothing in terms of trying to understand how um, the nervous system is uh, uh, solving quite spectacular uh, tasks. And I never regretted it, even though many people had at some point told me, why don't you work on vertebrates? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. select who was to give the vote of thanks, and, and he chose someone who was perfectly able to do so. Um, Professor Simon Laughlin is um, FRS. Um, he's a leading neurobiologist. He's from the Department of Zoology, University of Cambridge. Um, and he, he studies design principles of 
um, the structure and function of neurons and neural circuits um, from flies to humans. Um, and he understands how the eye and these processes are about um, efficient information processing. Um, and uh, I can't think of anyone more suited, but certainly Holger can't either. And so I'm so delighted that Simon is here to give a vote of thanks. Well, thank you. I'm sure that you will all join me in thanking Holger for giving a talk which, for those of you who don't know much about what flies actually do and how they work, probably struck you as truly amazing. Um, next time you swat a fly, you might <laughs> ponder about what a wonderful device you're crushing. It's much, much worse than stamping on somebody's iPhone, although it doesn't have the emotional overtone. <laughs> but as you might have also been surprised how much you could learn from the detailed study of this system. And of course, you can only learn that when you have the imagination and the perspective to ask new questions and see opportunities to answer old questions. And when you have the drive and the skill and the creativity to design the experiments and undertake the research that provides answers. And at the beginning of Holger's talk, he gave us some clue as to why he was motivated to do this. Now, I'd always suspected when I worked with Holger that he had a deeper understanding of brain and behavior than I had, and he revealed um, that, in fact, his roots lie in philosophy. <laughs> and Holger was originally interested in really deep problems, like the relationships between human brain activity and human behavior. What is it that the brain does to create the sense of self, for example, which enables us to cope or not with the world around us? Now, when there are many people in neuroscience are attracted to these deep problems because they are deep. But because you work on a deep problem, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will achieve a deep understanding. And Holger gave us his, in his talk his definition of a deep understanding. A deep understanding comes about when you understand enough about the, how the brain acquires the information it needs to generate meaningful behavior, and then process, you understand how that information is then processed to generate that meaningful behavior. Not by just reporting that you see something, but by actually doing it. Now, of course, that means that in order to achieve that, this, this deep understanding, you have to achieve the level of understanding that an engineer acquires when they design a device for a particular task. Now, of course, for many people working particularly in cognitive neuroscience, this definition of deep understanding is, is rather sort of cruel and, and puritanical. Um, and you might wonder, well, why is it useful? Well, I think we've seen many examples in Holger's talk about why this deeper understanding is useful. It's a common feature in science that when you understand one system deeply, that helps you understand other systems. And we've seen this in the two-way relationship that Holger has between flight control in flies and control systems engineering. Control systems engineers have deep understanding of control systems. And this knowledge has translated to Holger to help him explain how flies actually manage to fly in the real world. This better understanding of flies has created new, has shown us new ways of implementing control, ways that are both effective and energy efficient. And I think that illustrates perfectly that even the deep understanding of something that apparently looks rather simple and may not even to many people seem to be worth working on, like how an insect flies and controls its flight around the world, can in fact generate deep understanding and practical um, applications in the world around us. Now, when Holger left Cambridge, he had two job offers. One was from a very good classical biology department 
And at that stage, Holger was a renowned biologist. And he had an offer to come here. And Holger chose to come here. And he told me that he'd done this because he thought that he would learn more here than in a biology department. And I think that the Department of Bioengineering has lived up to Holger's expectations. It's brought him into contact with people who have deep understanding of the, the, that complements him. And we've seen how this better understanding has translated into important technical advances, such as the imaging of musculature. And if you haven't seen it, these amazing pic movies of flies bodies actually moving in three dimensions. You see all the internal parts working. They look like a, a wonderful Victorian machine with lots of little knobs and ratchets all going backwards and forwards like this. And this fly is beating its wings 200 times per second in an in a X-ray machine, a synchrotron. And it survives for about four seconds. These, these, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't say that, that's true. <laughs> This one, anyway. These video clips are easily accessible on, 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 on the internet. Um, they're absolutely amazing. And I'm sure that this would never have happened had not Holger come to bioengineering. As we've heard, Holger has, not only has Holger been well served by bioengineering, he has served bioengineering well. And all of us who work in vision research and insect neurobiology have known for many years that Holger is one of the kindest and most sympathetic and understanding and helpful people that you would ever have to work with. And it's great to see that in this environment, he's got something back, that there's a positive feedback, and that generates a real buzz that we hope will last longer than the buzz of a fly in a synchrotron. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so Holger, I would like to thank you well. for showing us just exactly what a wonderful thing a flying fly is. Mm. But not only for that, but for actually advancing our field and showing us things in neuroscience that are poorly understood and badly appreciated and demonstrating that they're important. And I think the one most important thing maybe for neuroscience in general that Holger has demonstrated is that the gulf between people who study sensory processing on the one hand and traditionally in neuroscience, it's a different group of people who study motor control, that this gulf is artificial. That the brain has evolved precisely so that information processed by sensory systems can generate adaptive motor responses. And not only has he shown us that this gulf is artificial, he has shown us how you can bridge that gulf with a multidisciplinary approach that uses and develops new tools. Thank you, Holger. Proceedings are closed, and we might now stimulate our senses in other ways after this. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, no, for all people um, coming to dinner and reception, uh, there will be some people who can guide you over there, and I will be joining in a, in a second as well at uh, NBCO and uh, each other over there then. Thanks very much for coming, and we saw you later. <laughs> I'm here. Do you need the job for saying the key forward and feedback stuff?